Listen up, marketers. If you're not taking advantage of retail media, you're missing out. That's why eMarketer has launched Retail Media Weekly, the first newsletter focused on the rapid growth of retail media. Get deep insights and exclusive data you won't find anywhere else. Gain the edge you need to explore this explosive marketing channel. Visit insiderintelligence.com slash retail dash daily and subscribe today. Hello, listeners. Today is Wednesday, July 5th. Welcome to Behind the Numbers, Reimagining Retail, an eMarketer podcast. This is the show where we talk about how retail collides with every part of our lives. I'm your host, Sarah Lebo. Today's episode topic is what happens when a big brand goes out of business? First, let's meet today's guests. Joining me for today's episode, we have VP of Content for our retail desk, Susie David Canyon. Welcome back, Susie. Hi, thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Also here today is Senior Analyst for our retail desk, Karina Perkins. Hey, Karina. Hi, Sarah. Good to be back. Good to have you. Let's get started with our first segment, News and Reviews, where I give the news and our guests tell me their reviews. Today's story is a June 28th Semaphore article titled, TikTok is opening its own online U.S. store. This isn't too surprising. TikTok has been hinting at e-commerce in the U.S. for a while, and it's a major part of the business model of its parent company, ByteDance, in Asia. Now TikTok will be competing with the likes of Amazon, as well as companies like Shein and Temu for U.S. e-commerce. Susie, your review of this story in 60 seconds is... I actually am a little bit surprised that TikTok is moving away from being a social platform that enables sales with their shop to an actual retailer, because the biggest difference here is that they're going to own the logistics and also the inventory. So it's kind of weird that they're embedding their website, their store, their actual store into their app. It's also going to be available online just in general. They're saying it has to do with poor customer service. It just seems like it's so expensive to put up your own retail shop versus just hiring people for a call center or thinking through how do you make that experience a little bit better on TikTok and ensure that people are having a positive of experience without having all of these extra expenses, which I'm not even sure that they're going to be able to have economies of scale on. That's a great point. And it definitely draws a lot of attention to TikTok in the US where it's receiving a ton of scrutiny. Karina, your review of this story in 60 seconds is... Sure. So I think this is a really interesting move and they're trialing something similar in the UK called Trendy Beat. So they're basically watching what items are popular and then making them themselves and selling them direct. So like Susie, I think it's it's interesting in one way because they are essentially having the complexity now of becoming an e-commerce retailer. Um, but they also have the ability to then take the profit from all of the sales rather than just earning a commission off sales, which is what I assume is driving this. And also also, because they can lean in on their data, they can really track what's popular and potentially, I guess, even create their own trends by sort of promoting uh, products to the top of people's feeds. Although that's something they're going to have to be a little bit careful with, with the regulators and their use of data and things like that is, is going to be something that will be watched fairly closely, I imagine. Trendy Beat is such a TikTok name for something. Like, I love that's, it. It's so similar to like TikTok style to me. Now it's time for our next segment. Retell me this, retell me that. Where we discuss an interesting retail topic. Today's topic is what happens when a big brand goes out of business. It's happened before, it'll happen again. Bed Bath & Beyond and Party City are two of the more recent retailers to declare bankruptcy. We've also seen store closures this year from Foot Locker, Tuesday Morning, Gap, Banana Republic, Bath & Body Works, and more. According to UBS, more than 50,000 stores that are now open in the US may be closed by 2027. We're gonna break down every piece of what happens when these big brands shutter their doors. So let's start with the physical location, and we can look at this in the US and the UK. What happens to the property when a big brand closes a store or many stores? Susie, why don't you start with that one? Sure. So I think the interesting thing here is, uh, in addition to the 50,000 stores that UBS was talking about, they also talked a little bit more about what types of stores will be most impacted by those closures that they're projecting. It is still only 5% of total stores in the US. So we do need to keep that in mind. And we all know that online is still a fraction of sales here in the US. I know it's different in the UK. But the stores 
are big empty shells, right? So depending on the store that goes out of business, different types of stores may come in or different types of services may come in. Like I know for Bed Bath & Beyond, Planet Fitness has started going into their store space, just like other very large outlet type stores, because Bed Bath & Beyond typically very large stores off mall. So I think uh, the question is so broad because it'll all just depend on where that shell of a store is located, how big it's located. If it's in a mall, I mean, we're starting to hear stories around um, pet shops are already there, but now adoption centers. In Canada, we have malls that have DMVs and libraries. And so I think we're going to start seeing a lot more mixed use case malls, which will help drive traffic. Is that the same case in the UK, Karina? Similar in some ways and different in others, I would say. Um, Some of the retailers that we've seen go out of business in this country, have kind of smaller high street locations. Um, We've seen a lot of them taken over by coffee shops and quick service restaurants. Um, We've also seen quite a lot of pop-up retail pop-ups. So landlords are renting them out to online retailers and designers as a kind of pop-up store so they can test the waters. In some cases, we've seen other retailers uh, taking over them. So IKEA um, is opening up in one of Topshop's Oxford Street store. And it's also um, taken over the King's Mall in London and leased back the stores to other retailers and created its own kind of really uh, city focused store that is a bit different to your typical IKEA store. Um, and then we've seen uh, M&S is opening much bigger stores in former Debenham sites. So we've seen quite a lot of different retailers go into those stores and, and open them as a slightly different format to what they usually have. Um, and there's quite a lot of efforts here to really revive the high street in the UK. And the UK government is actually considering plans to force commercial landlords who are sitting on empty shops to auction the rental rights to the property if they're empty for a really long time, because obviously empty stores are bad for everybody. Sure. So we have new stores, new experiences coming in and filling those places, and hopefully not just empty shells of stores sitting around. I think, Sarah, one of the distinction is around scarcity of the space. So like the mall is harder. And I guess High Street is very different, right? If we think about flagship streets uh, or Union Square in San Francisco, which is a whole other story. But Mall space, I think, will get a lot more different types of businesses to help drive foot traffic because the mall is not quite as popular and it's a little bit of a chicken or egg. Like, do we revitalize the mall or do we figure out the stores and the composition of the stores? But in like the case of Bed Bath & Beyond and Toys R Us, those stores were in off mall. So it's so much more lucrative to be in that space and there aren't that many great off mall properties. And so I think those will, like Karina was saying, get filled by other retailers because it's a good spot. Okay, so speaking of Bed Bath & Beyond in particular, when businesses declare bankruptcy, that's not usually the end of their story. So Bed Bath & Beyond, uh, as an example, last week, Overstock.com announced that they were going to rename themselves to be Bed Bath & Beyond. My question for both of you is when a brand goes out of business, shutters stores, what happens to the brand itself? How does it live on? Karina, why don't you kick that one off? Sure. So we've seen a fair amount of this kind of example of consolidation in the UK where other retailers are buying uh, these brands out of administration, not necessarily always the stores, but sometimes just the intellectual property. So um, we've seen that with a couple of retailers in the UK. Next has bought a few brands, including Kath Kidson and Jules. Um, in the case of Jules, it's still operating some of those stores, uh, but it's also bringing the website under its kind of umbrella brand We've also seen some of them snapped up by online retailers. So Boohoo's been buying some high street businesses and turning them into online only operations, um, such as Karen Mellon Coast, Oasis and Warehouse. And in some cases, though, we are seeing brands which have uh, formerly closed stores and disappeared returning to the high street. So an interesting one is Toys R Us, which closed its UK branches in 2018, but it is now opening up concessions within WH Smith stores in a partnership with the retailer. And similarly, Gap, which closed its UK stores in 2021, has a joint venture partnership now with Next and is opening Gap concessions in Next stores. So we're seeing several of those brands coming back by working in partnership with other retailers. So a lot of purchasing, a lot of partnerships. Yeah. Susie, what's this look like in the U.S.? I mean, it's more or less the same. I think the first question, though, is, is the brand 
worth saving, right? Maybe the stores, the business model, sometimes it's easier to declare bankruptcy and start all over again than it is to try and figure it out and have to pay all your creditors and everybody else that you need to pay. So I think a lot of brands that are strong go into bankruptcy with the hope of being able to come out, obviously, right? And so one of those ways, like Karina's saying, is companies buying you and your property intellectual property and then deciding what to do. In the U.S., one of the things that I thought was interesting is, uh, and it's not new, um, Authentic Brands Group, which is one of these umbrella companies that buys a lot of brands and then tries to run their business separately, teamed up with one of our mall properties, Simon Property Group, to create a a venture-backed sort of joint venture company called Spark. And they've been buying brands as well and trying to figure out, I don't think there's a one-hit wonder solution. I think it really does start with the, is this brand worth saving? Like if you think about Radio Shack back in the day, them too, they went out, but the intellectual property was bought. That is probably the easiest way to revitalize. Yeah, I mean, I th- I think that's why it's such an interesting move that Overstock.com would call itself Bed Bath & Beyond, because, I don't know, is this brand worth aligning yourself with? I think so, right? In the U.S., uh, Bed Bath & Beyond is often associated with a lot of big, big life chapter things, going to college, your first apartment, potentially getting married in a wedding registry, a baby registry. So I do think that there's probably a lot of brand value and brand love. And everybody was probably very shocked. Bed Bath is one of those where they really had a tough time coming out of these difficult business decisions that they made and opted out. And so the surprising part for me is it's not like a one-two because Overstock here is a pretty big brand. So I'm shocked also. Well, that's a great point about uh, what Bed Bath & Beyond is associated with. In Amanda Mull's story in The Atlantic uh, called You Will Miss Bed Bath & Beyond, she wrote about exactly this, how um, Bed Bath & Beyond is associated with these like life milestones. I know that when I went to college, the first thing we did when we got to Ann Arbor was stop at Bed Bath & Beyond and pick up my shower caddy. So does the brand's bankruptcy change how consumers behave around life milestones? Does that behavior move online? Or does the behavior moving online, is that what causes the brand's bankruptcy? So I actually, I think what happens is the life moments will stay, right? You you will always have that life moment, but maybe now you'll go to a Macy's instead of going to bedbathandbeyond.com, right? And so I think what happens is when these brands start to falter and divest or close down completely or get closed down temporarily to get bought back. Other similar brands, retailers, try to rally around it and try and get that customer. So for example, Victoria's Secret decided to come out of their swimsuit business a long time ago. And so all of the mall in-mall properties that sold swimsuits tried to rally around and welcome the Victoria's Secret bathing suit customer to their mm-hmm. stores, right? So I don't think life moments will change. I think consumers just will find different places. And then it's up to retailers to try and remind the customers and capture those customers. Like when all the JCPenney stores started closing in the mall, all of the big anchor tenants should have been going to the JCPenney's of the world and trying to capture capture that customer into their store. That's a great point. Closures obviously open up opportunities for competitors. Like the container store is letting customers cash in on those Bed Bath & Beyond coupons, the ones that my mom keeps in a giant Ziploc bag in the center console of her car. Or Bed Bath & Beyond's closure could boost Amazon's $50 billion U.S. home furnishings e-commerce market. So I guess my question here is, what is the opportunity for competitors when big brands close? And Karina, I'll go to you first on this one. Sure, I think there's an obvious opportunity for competitors. And I don't think that it's necessarily that the opportunity is only for e-commerce competitors like Amazon. I think actually quite often a very close brick and mortar competitor or one with a multi-channel offering will do quite well out of it and will be able to then take those sales. Because I don't think that just because a brick and mortar chain has shut that suddenly people say, okay, we're just going to shop online. Uh, Like Susie said, I think there's a bit of a mix. It's not necessarily only closing because everyone started shopping online. It's also because there have been some problems with profitability along the way. There's kind of a lot of different factors that can feed into that. So I really think in the UK, certainly the sort of people that we're seeing benefiting from these sorts of closures are ones that have really strong omnichannel presence. Because actually, interestingly, in the UK, we're seeing a bit of a high street revival where a lot of brick and mortar 
retailers are doing really well and their on and online businesses are in trouble. So I think it's really those who have a really good mix and give a really good experience across both channels are the ones who seem to be doing really well at the moment and seem to benefit. Moving along with that conversation of who's been doing really well, I think that's a great transition into our next segment. Now it's time for pop-up rankings, where we take a look at specific examples and we rank them. Today, Karina and Susie will each be ranking one retailer or brand that's innovating really well and one brand that may be at risk. Karina, why don't you go first with a brand that you feel is innovating well? Sure. And I'm going to talk about Next here, which is a retailer that I've already mentioned a couple of times today. And I think it's a really example of a business that just does the basics really, really well. Um, it's got really good stock control. So they've avoided kind of disruption while others haven't. They have, they're not massively overstocked. Um, it's clever pricing. It's affordable without being kind of really budget. Um, in terms of its clothing range, it's it's fairly middle of the road, really. But that's actually what a lot of people want. It kind of offers clothing for all the family and a few homeware bits. It's been really good at gaining market share from other stores. It's been clever about the brands that it's been buying and bringing under its umbrella. And it was also quite quick to jump on the idea of a kind of third party marketplace. So giving smaller brands access to its online logistics and back end operating systems and in return, getting more traffic to its site. It offers a really good sort of click and collect service and it's kept a lot of its legacy stores open because it understands the benefits of being able to service online returns in stores. So it's got a really good omnichannel strategy. And I think it's just a great example of a retailer that is, as I said, doing the basics really, really well. For people who may not be as familiar with UK shopping like myself, what is Next sort of comparable to? It's like a Old Navy slash Zara. It's like lower price point, like basics, and it is well-made-ish for the price point. It's like value-driven. Love that. Old Navy slash Zara is exactly what I need right now. Susie, why don't you give us an example of a retailer or brand that's innovating really well right now? So I picked Brooks Brothers because I thought, you know, it's a heritage brand that, yes, three-ish years ago went into bankruptcy, but I don't know that people realize just how old the company is. It's like, I think they were saying it's around 200 years old. It's dressed over 40 presidents. Yeah. It's known as the brand of Wall Street and was for a long time. I think part of their demise, which had nothing to do with COVID, was that they banked on their heritage. And so they didn't sort of move with the times in terms of the casualization of the workplace. And how if you think about athleisure, that's not a new trend, right? So COVID obviously exasperated that. Um, Brooks Brother went into bankruptcy. They got bought by, like we said, that um, joint venture between uh, Authentic Brands Group and Spark. They got a whole new team dedicated to the brand. And now they have really come out of it on the other end in terms of better merchandise mix, better understanding what the consumer wants, better price points, good quality. And so I think they are really trying to lean into who their customer is, but also just understand that times are changing and they are shifting with that. So you know, as Karina said, it's so important as a brand, if you want to be successful or a retailer, that you are flexible and that you are able to sort of innovate with the times. There's this great podcast called Articles of Interest that uh, focuses on the history of preppy clothes in the U.S. And they talked a lot about Brooks Brothers and uh, sort of this evolution of preppy clothes that I think like continues now, right? Like it's it started with these like sort of upscaled army fatigues and needed to continue innovating to now. And I think that's yeah. that's really what you've broken down there. And the thing about poor Brooks Brothers is that, you know, you have to stay authentic to your brand. But I think what they didn't realize necessarily 10 years ago was that the competition is changing, right? And there are so many more, as you say, preppy brands on the market that are fun and cool and still preppy. And so I think, you know, you have to continue to innovate, remain authentic, but, you know, not lose sight of what's happening. You can't have your head in the sand. Yeah. I mean, the concept of basics, I'm doing air quotes, but I guess listeners can't see them. The concepts of of apparel basics is changing. And that's something that you, you need to evolve with. Absolutely. Okay. Let's shift to retailers or brands that may be at risk. Karina, what's an example of one of these brands or retailers? Okay. So I'm going to go with Wilco, which is a discount store here in the UK that sells homeware, gardenware, household products at a very low price. 
And it's an interesting example because it's a discounter, which you would think would probably be doing really well, given we've got a cost of living crisis and the discount channel is forecast to be growing quite strongly at the moment. And indeed, some rival discounters are. But it is struggling a bit in what's quite a crowded market these days. It's had quite a lot of problems with stock shortages. So there have been some empty shelf problems. Its stores are looking a little bit dated. It has switched to self-checkout and reduced staff in stores, in some stores, I believe, um, which is for some people creating less of a good shopping experience because there are now some queues. Um, It's got a lot of high street locations, which means people can struggle for parking. And that can be a problem for people if they're going to buy all of their kind of household and garden needs. And it is, has now implemented click and collect, but it was a, a bit slower than some others to kind of start thinking about omnichannel. So I think it's interesting as an example that just because you're selling things at very low prices, it doesn't mean that people will ex- accept a less good shopping experience in store. Sure, that makes sense. So is Wilco similar to like a home goods in the US? Yeah, yeah, very similar. So Wilco, our example of an at-risk brand in the UK. Susie, what's an at-risk brand in the US? So I'm sad to say this one, but I would say it's Gap Inc. So Gap Inc. has multiple brands under it. I think they have a really good mix of types of brands. So Gap Inc., in and of itself, not sure it's at risk as much as some of its brands underneath, like Gap itself and even Banana Republic. And I think it goes back to the Brooks Brother conversation, right? You can't rely on your heritage and Gap is very old, right? And not as old as Brooks Brother, but it has a strong history in the US. Um, You can't rely on that. And you have to think about who the consumer is today and what they're looking for. So plain and simple, but expensive just doesn't cut it anymore. Um, And so it's Gap and Banana Republic are struggling to find their space. And with all of the new brands that are coming up, they're just having a tough time. Also, both of them are mostly based in malls. Then it becomes a chicken or egg. Do you invest in your stores that are in malls or do you invest in the mall in the hopes that the stores get better, which obviously they don't have a lot of control over that. So I am a little bit nervous for them. They have announced a ton of store closures. Banana Republic was said to reduce 30% of its store count in a short period of time. Gap is now selling on Amazon, which is also another indicator of they need help to get their product out. So I'm they're on my lookout. Okay, so we're keeping watch on Gap Inc. That makes sense. Similar conversation, like what it means to sell basics is shifting and people don't necessarily need to go to Gap for those anymore. Okay, well, that is all that we have time for today. So thank you for joining me, Karina. Thanks so much. And thank you, Susie. Thanks for having me. Please give us a rating and review wherever you listen to podcasts and follow us on Instagram at behind the numbers underscore podcast. Thank you to our listeners and to John who edited this episode. We'll be back next Wednesday with another episode of Reimagining Retail and eMarketer podcast. And tomorrow, join Marcus for another episode of the Behind the Numbers Daily. Come <laughs> on.